Everybody else have a good week one? What? I'll tell you what, the prop bets were insane. You could bet color of the Gatorade, coin toss, the length of the national anthem. Uh, they said there was a three and a half million dollar bet on uh, the Gatorade being orange, and they would have won like nineteen million or something. I don't, I don't, I didn't stay up to see what the Gatorade color was. I'm fairly certain you could have bet on if there was going to be a streak or two. Like there was a, any you anything you can think of. They had they had money. Let's just wait another minute. I'm missing a lot. Hey, my man, how are you doing? You have a good weekend? Yeah. Wedding wasn't bad? You have any pictures? Yeah. Yeah, what about any any of you in the dress? <laughs> yeah. The whole class gets one bonus point if we get that picture. I like pretty good. The back was too much. <laughs> <laughs> oh, too funny. Too funny. All right. So before we start, let me just go over a couple of things that we might want to consider. Friday's class kind of went a, a little bit sideways, so my apologies for that. Um, we're going to do the diabetes lecture today. Today, if you were in class on Friday, you saw the first three or four slides, but as I talked to some people online, you were online, probably couldn't hear anything. Uh, I got some feedback and said that they didn't see any. So we're just going to redo the first couple slides. No big deal. A little bit of repetition won't kill you. Um, as for the quiz, it was supposed to be available right after class, the last couple minutes of class on Friday. So it will be today um, in lieu of Friday's quiz, where it was going to be sort of at the end of class, I'll give you the last couple of minutes, and this quiz will stay open until tomorrow night at midnight, since it was supposed to be Friday. We actually have two kids in this class who aren't here live face-to-face, -face, so it would be unfair probably to make it directly right after. That's not what the syllabus reflects right this second, but I'll change it. So it will open today, right when I'm done, I'll, I'll go on Blackboard and open it up for you. It'll be the 20 minutes that you usually have. Uh, and it will be 10 questions, okay? And it will encompass this lecture and the lectures that we did last week. Uh, your four-week grades were submitted this morning. I don't know how many days until it reflects on you or shows you what exactly you got. Just a reminder that you only have two quizzes that are reflective of that four-week grade. Why am I saying this? Don't panic if you have a grade that you don't really like or you think you deserve a better one. There's tons of points left in this class. Um, but this could be a little kick in the butt to try to get you going if you missed a quiz or if you did really poorly on the first two quizzes. Um, so just don't panic when it comes. If you are distressed, please just shoot me an email and talk about it. Anybody have any questions? So the quiz, I will shoot an email tomorrow too. We'll close tomorrow night at midnight. Okay. Okay, so let's talk about diabetes. 
Diabetes affects about 29 million in the United States. Now, I know we went over obesity last week. That's hundreds of millions of people. Um, 86 million have prediabetes. That's individuals who don't have the full-blown disease who are not calculated into that 29 million um, that actually have it. Now, I think, if unless I'm uh, mistaken, West Virginia has one of the highest levels of obesity in the country. Um, and I know diabetes, they rank up in the top five as well. Uh, so this is very prevalent to you, especially if you consider uh, remaining here and living here. Um, it is considered an epidemic. So inside a pandemic, now we've already talked about two epidemics, uh, the obesity epidemic as well as the diabetes epidemic. One of the reasons for the epidemic is the increase in obesity. Again, we talked about it last week, how many people are, are increasingly overweight, especially those in childhood, right? Uh, which lead to type two diabetes, which we'll talk about. And if you have full-blown diabetes, not pre-diabetes, your death rate is two times that of what it would be if you did not have diabetes. We're gonna look at some of the economic effect as well today. But first, I want to go over there are two types. Now, this should be an easy question because most of you are here and we already went over some of the reasons that there are two types of diabetes. What are the differences? So somebody said one you're born with and the other your health causes it. That's true. That's true. What are the differences? That's, that's a big one. There are other differences though, more specifically. Isn't one where your like body doesn't produce like any insulin and then the other one is like, it can ex like it, it can improve, like produce like lower or like too high of amounts? Correct, yes. What did you say? Correct. He said one, you're resistant, one, you don't make it. That's correct. So let's look at the different types. Type one, no insulin is produced. And we're gonna go over why some of your beta cells in your pancreas don't secrete that insulin. Uh, type two, you do still have insulin. However, that insulin has changed shape. So now you can no longer use it. That would be like trying to fit a, your home key into a different lock, and expecting that lock to open. Type two, you don't, you do have insulin, but you can't use it. Type one is often diagnosed in childhood. Over 90% of cases of type one in childhood. Um, type two, often diagnosed in adults. However, it's becoming more prevalent in children, uh, pri primarily because of the obesity epidemic. Type one cannot be prevented. Once you have type one, you have diabetes forever. There's no cure for type, type one diabetes. Type two, however, with lifestyle change and modification, you can uh, rectify type two. Type one is treated with insulin injections. Type two is also can be treated with insulin injections and lifestyle modification, depending on how severe it is. And unfortunately, type two is the most of, uh, a common type of diabetes. 90 to 95% of cases are type two, which means they can be modified, they can be fixed. Right. So let's look at type 1 diabetes. What happens to type 1 diabetes? What? Uh, morphology. So you have two types of cells on the pancreas. You have alpha and you have beta cells. The alpha cells don't worry about. Beta cells are what secrete insulin. Now, when you guys say you eat a donut this morning for breakfast, you get blood glucose, right? Sugars circulating around systemically. The pancreas uh, kind of is alerted at that point and the beta cells secrete insulin, the appropriate amount of insulin for the appropriate amount of blood sugar inside the systemic circulation, right? That's for you healthy individuals. If you have type one diabetes, these beta cells go from big, see beta cell mass here on the left-hand side, start off normal size. And as type one diabetes sets in, beta cells get smaller and smaller until they do not work anymore, where they do not secrete insulin anymore. So this results in the body's inability to actually push glucose into the cell. And we're gonna see that mechanism here as well. But the predominant mechanism is those beta cells do not secrete insulin. Type two diabetes is often brought on by poor lifestyle choices. 
Now this isn't 100% of the cases, right? I could, I could go eat 100 donuts a day for the next three years and not get type 2 diabetes. That's totally possible. And my counterpart could eat uh, 10 donuts a day for the next three years and get type 2 diabetes. There are multiple factors that go into this form of diabetes. You have environmental factors, exercise, nutrition, and you have genetic factors that could genetically predispose you to this disease. Um, it's most common in middle-aged adults. The average age of individuals who contract, oh, that's probably a bad word for it, who uh, kind of get type 2 diabetes is getting younger and younger, primarily because of the obesity increase in, in children. And type 2 diabetes, again, is you do have circulating insulin. I take in glucose. My insulin helps me take in that glucose and decrease blood glucose levels. In type 2 diabetes, you do have insulin. It's just unusable. Okay? You can create insulin. Your beta cells in the type 2 diabetes uh, do work. They just create bad insulin. So here's a, if you're visually, uh, visual learner, genetic predisposition and environmental factors for type 2 diabetes. Uh, environmental factors, as I said, um, sedentary activity, uh, bad nutrition can lead to obesity. Obesity can lead to the insulin resistance, meaning you do have insulin, you just can't use it, which means you would have decreased glucose uptake, lead to hyperglycemia, which we'll go into that a little later, increased blood glucose, and lead to type 2 diabetes. Or you could have a genetic predisposition to lead to insulin resistance. Basically, the bottom line is insulin resistance is the whole crux of the type 2 diabetes. So you do have insulin, you just can't use it. Any questions about that? Differences at all? Okay, let's talk about some of the complications, acute and chronic. Now, this is for both sets, type 1 and type 2, right? You have the same uh, detriments in both diseases. They're, they're on onset and brought on by two different factors, um, but the complications are the same. Acute, you have hyperglycemia and hypoglycemia. Hyper, too much blood glucose, right? Too much blood sugar. I eat a donut, that blood sugar circulates and circulates. There's nothing pushing it in, especially if I'm sedentary. You can have hypoglycemia if I take too much insulin. Now my blood glucose is, is decreased. What's a normal blood glucose? What's ACSM recommend? Come on, we got to know our risk factors. Especially if you're going to work in a clinic one day or cardiac rehab or pulmonary rehab, you need to know this. Which potentially, if you've eaten breakfast, what's your blood glucose right now? Anybody have a guess? So for clinic purposes, right around 100, between 100 and 120, typically that's all good. Now, everybody anatomically a little bit different. I'll go into a story later that will illustrate that a little more. But anywhere around 100, usually you feel okay, nothing's wrong. That's where a healthy individual would maintain. If I had a donut, I'd have a spike in blood glucose. Then my insulin would bring it back down to normal levels. Okay. Chronically, that's acute. So if I eat something, I have an immediate spike in blood glucose, right? And then I have it come back down. Or if I take too much insulin, immediately have too little blood glucose, which can affect things like cognitive function, coordination, but chronically, if you have type 1 or type 2 diabetes for a long period of time, 20, 30, 40 years, uh, you can have micro and macrovascular damage, both um, accompanying the fact that you have too high blood glucose for a long period of time. That gives you little nicks and cuts inside the arterial bed walls, inside the endothelial layer of the arterial beds. Now, you do have smooth muscle. You can vasoconstrict. You can vasodilate. Uh, arterial beds to bring blood flow to a certain area uh, in order to uh, take on higher blood pressures, to uh, take on higher heart rates, to uh, help maintain the stress on the vascular walls. Now, as uh, you have this disease for longer and longer, um, you do get these micro tears inside that, that lining in the, in the vasculature, arteries and veins. Um, this can lead to artery stiffening. This can lead to um, neuropathy of the hands and feet. That's one of the main comp complications of diabetes as well. If you know anybody and they're older, 
Typically, they lose sensation in their fingers and their toes. That's from uh, this microvascular and macrovascular damage. So problems acute and chronic. We're probably going to look at the more acute from exercise, because if you ever come into contact with an individual with type 1 or type 2 diabetes, um, acutely, if you're going to exercise them, is kind of the main concern. So let's look at the mechanism real quick. How does this work? If you're healthy, I eat a donut, you know. I get blood glucose circulating systemically. My pancreas secretes insulin. Obviously, this is a cartoon image, right? Insulin isn't triangular shape. Um, but for purposes of this picture, this is the insulin. Now, imagine this uh, receptor here. Not receptor, sorry. This, this round cell, we'll call it a muscle cell. The muscle cell has an insulin receptor on it, as well as a glucose channel. Now, if you do not have circulating insulin, this glucose channel remains closed. That way, if the circulating blood glucose cannot get into the cells, cannot penetrate the cells, and remain systemically circulating. However, with the uh, ejection of insulin from the pancreas, um, binds this ins insulin receptor, opens the glucose channel, allowing glucose to free flow into muscle cells to actively be used, okay? Now imagine uh, you have type two diabetes, right? This triangular shape insulin becomes a square. Now the square tries to fit in the insulin receptor module, can't do it, won't fit. If you can't fit, then the GLUT4 receptor will not open. You can't have glucose flowing into the cell. That, that remains systemic, right? That's how type 2 diabetes affects you. Type 1 blocks you off at this arrow right here, right after the pancreas. You don't secrete insulin. And if you don't secrete insulin, you can't open the GLUT4 receptor. Anybody have any questions about that, how this works? Okay, how do you know how much insulin to take? This is sort of out of the scope of what you guys are going to be asked to do in the field, I would imagine. Um, in my year of cardiac rehab, this was, you know, not a year, it was less than a year, but when we saw individuals with diabetes, usually diabetes was a secondary um, disease state that they have. Usually they come in with, uh, they just had a heart attack or they just had um, bypass surgery of some sort. And if they have diabetes, that's just another thing you have to think about. Now, why would I have to think about how much insulin to take when I eat in terms of exercise? How can that affect my exercise? When you exercise, say you, you get up from your chair right now, okay? What are you using to burn for fuel to move around? Just to walk. Well, you're predominantly going to be using fats at lower intensity exercise, but it's always a mixture of fats and glucose, right? So you're already using uh, glucose, right? So you guys are going to be chewing up some of the glucose, blood glucose that you already have. Imagine an individual taking too much insulin, right? Take too much insulin, then what happens? Then you already have low blood glucose. Now you're using some with exercise, which can create complications, dizziness, loss of coordination, loss of cognitive function and that can become troublesome. So whenever you're in a clinic, and this is always, always what they do, if you have diabetes before we exercise you, before we put you on a treadmill, uh, usually in cardiac and pulmonary rehab, they put an EKG on you, a little three lead. Uh, we'll take your heart rate, blood pressure, and if you have diabetes, we're going to check your, uh, your blood glucose levels. If it's under a certain threshold, if it's probably under 90 or under 100, and they're going to have you drink orange juice or eat some club crackers or something with some carbohydrates in it to increase your blood glucose before exercise. Okay. But it is very important. Low blood glucose is way more dangerous acutely than high blood glucose. Uh, and I, there's a story I'll tell you here in a minute that will sort of clear that. Any questions so far? Yes. So some of the chronic complications with too high is that macular and micro damage. But acutely, even if it's way too high, it can make you blind. Um, 
And there are a couple other kidney diseases associated with uh, too high blood glucose that I'm not totally sure of, but um, it has to be really high. Like we're talking three, four, five hundred. And it probably for 20, 40 minutes before it actually would actually do something to you. But if you had low blood sugar, if you're in the, between 50, 40, 30 blood sugar, acutely, your body does not, I mean, it, it saves glucose for your brain to function. So it sort of shuts off glucose functioning from all the other parts. And that can lead to a lot of complications very, very shortly. So can we get glucose into the cell another way? I told you that we use glucose at moderate intensity exercise. If you guys walk out of here, you're using blood glucose, right? Um, now that's not via insulin. You're not secreting insulin when you guys are standing up. I'm walking around the room right now. My pancreas isn't secreting insulin so that I can use my fuel. So how does that happen? How do you guys use blood glucose without eating? What do you think happens? We just don't use glucose if we don't eat. You have to eat before you exercise. Has anybody ever exercised fasted? Has anybody ever fasted? You feel like hell, right? Yeah. After eight to 12 hours, you don't feel good. When you exercise, sometimes you even feel better. You know why you feel better? So we'll get into this a little too, um, but as you fast, your blood glucose remains the same because you can uh, maintain blood glucose from the liver, which secretes glucagon, which will increase blood glucose, as well as your exercise pushes glucose into the cell. The mechanical contraction of the cell, or uh, sorry, of the muscle belly pushes glucose into the cell without insulin. So you can mechanically override that GLUT4 receptor with exercise. You just basically are kicking down the door of that glucose 4 receptor and just pushing glucose into the cell. That's why individuals with diabetes, um, if they exercise with low blood glucose to start with, uh, can be a big issue because now they're using the glucose that they have left too. So now they're driving their glucose even lower. So it says if someone injects insulin before exercise, it can have up to double the effect. So exercise doubles the effect of insulin. If you're just sitting there sedentary, insulin obviously helps you uptake glucose. If you go to exercise as well, the mechanical contractions of the muscle bellies push glucose in, the remaining glucose. So now you have double the effect. You have mechanical contraction and you have chemical um, induction of the GLUT4 receptor, allowing all of the uh, glucose to get into the cell. Does everybody understand that? Any questions online so far? It's kind of a, it's a complicated thing because now you have multiple factors you have to take into consideration. Oh, I took Gino's blood glucose before he's gonna exercise on the treadmill and it's a hundred. And intrinsically you're like, ACSM says that's great. Well, hey Gino, when did you last take your insulin? Oh, uh, 20 minutes ago. And your mind should go, oh crap. You know, his blood glucose is going to drop and I'm putting him on the treadmill. Hey, Gino, why don't we, here's some orange juice. Why don't you drink some orange juice? We'll just spike his blood glucose, just predetermined just a little bit, and then we can exercise him. That at least hedges us so that he doesn't get dizzy, doesn't pass out, isn't feeling lethargic while he's exercising. You know, he might be straight up and down, he might fall. You know, this could avert a lot of different complications that you could run into. Okay, so here's some of the uh, levels of blood glucose here for frame of reference. Excellent, about 115. HbA1c, that's just a long term. We're not going to get into that. If you have diabetes or you're a diabetic for a chronic period of time, uh, you get your HbA1c levels taken, I think, either monthly or bi-monthly. Sorry, not bi every other month or monthly. This shows long-term glucose. It's an average of what your glucose has been over the last month, right? Um, or the last, you know, however many days. Um, but as we see, it gets into the 180s to 380s. It gets red, high, 
or anything really under 80, that, that would scare me. Even under 115 during exercise, if I'm going to exercise somebody, I'd be a little bit worrisome. Uh, so let's talk about the complications. And actually, I thought about you guys this weekend. My uh, buddy just bought a house just north of the West Virginia border. He's fixing it up. He's, he's very handy. I'm not. So it's, it's neat to watch him do these things. But my best friend and, and me went up to see this house that he just bought. And my best friend's name is Talon. He has type 1 diabetes. And he's had it, I think, since he was 11. We're very chronic. Um, and we were up there, and we were supposed to go out to eat. We got tied up. He was laying floor and whatever. Uh, so we, we were up there for a while. And I, I've known Talon my whole life. I know his actions. I know his demeanor. I know typically what he says. I, I know what he does in situations because he lived beside me when I was young. He doesn't have any brothers and sisters, neither do I. He's a brother to me. Uh, you know, we were having a couple of drinks. He switched to a sugary drink. That flag number one for me. He doesn't usually drink sugary drinks because of his, you know, his diabetes. He doesn't have his insulin, whatever. He switched to a sugary drink. Didn't really think much of it. You know, I, I thought, oh, you know, maybe he's just craving that and you know, so forth. And then he started to act weird. He, he started to be obnoxious. Uh, he started to be loud. And then there was intermittent loud and then very quiet, loud and then very quiet. And then that was kind of flag number two. I was, I was like, hey, are you okay? How are you feeling? Probing him, you know, not trying to take care of him, just making sure he's okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm good. And then we got finished with the floor. We were all sitting down and things got a little bit weirder. So I, I went over and I kind of gave him a little tap on the shoulder with my fist. I forget what we were talking about, but his sweatshirt was wet, was sweat. And by the way, Jake's house doesn't have heat yet, freezing, I'm cold. I'm like, what is wrong with you? You're sweating, you're acting weird, blood sugar, 61. And then we gave him, he ate like a whole bag of chocolates. I'm talking 20 some pieces of chocolate. And I was like, okay, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like you're gonna overinflate yourself. And then I was like, I realized like way better up than low right now. Cause if he passes out really, the driveway is probably three quarter of a mile long. I mean, we're kind of in the middle of nowhere. Uh, I was like, okay, yeah, you're right. Let's just eat. So anyway, he got it up to 210, which by the way, not good either, way too high. Um, but you can actually see the morphology from somebody going from normal to not. He had to go to the bathroom more frequently. He was craving a sugary drink. He didn't even realize he did it when I told him afterwards. But usually when you crave food, it's not necessarily you're craving that flavor, uh, but you're craving something in it. Right. So he was craving that what, what was a white claw. Right. And I'm like, you, you never drink. You never drink. White, what, why would you do that? But intrinsically, he knew that that's what he needed. And he knew it's, when it's a more of a feel thing. Obviously, I don't know if any of you have diabetes. He's like, I can tell. He's like, I know immediately. And when I say I know I said at the beginning of class that anatomically we're all kind of different. He immediately gets like that when he's about eight. Right. 80 milligrams per deciliter of blood sugar, he gets sort of weird and funky. Now, when I was in cardiac rehab, we had thresholds, right? That if he was under 100, we'd have to give him some glucose. Um, but everybody looks and feels different with different fluctuations. I know that there was a, a, a young lady, not young, a little bit old, younger for cardiac rehab. She had diabetes. Once her blood glucose got to 100, she started to act weird. Even though 100 is normal, anatomically, for some reason, that's kind of what set her off. She started to sweat. She started to get lethargic. She started to, you know, get woozy. These are things that we need to look out for. Ask questions. Hey, are you okay? Pat them on the back make sure they're okay. Go behind them, make sure they're not swaying, things of that nature, just to make sure, you know, that everybody is sort of in tune, everybody's sort of safe, and so forth. All right, I'm going to stop real quick, take attendance. Make sure everybody's here. Still here. Okay, hey, if you're online, uh, unmute yourself when I call your name and say here. Oh, one second. If you're here, obviously just say here. This will be easy. Uh, Grace. Dylan, Jalen, Garrett, Olivia, Alexis, Gracie, Alyssa, Katie, 
Krista. Olivia. Wait, I already said I was here. I don't know which Olivia. <laughs> oh, no, you're good. I got you. I got you. Bailey. Alexis, I see you online. Austin. Alexis, that was, you need to sound more enthusiastic. Got it, got it. Pick it up. Here. <laughs> there you go. Isaiah, you're here. And Chandler. Who did? Oh, Jan, right? Gotcha. She's, she's a 10. So does that make sense? Oh, did I share this again? Okay, so I have a question. Can you hear me? Yeah, what's up? Okay, so I know like that some people are treated with insulin, but why are some people with diabetes not treated with insulin? Like, do you have to be like at a certain level or like? Um, type one diabetics always treated with insulin 100% of the time uh, because they don't, there's no level to type one diabetes. It's all, you either have it or you don't. It's like a light switch, it's on or it's off. Type two, there's like a fluctuating scale. For example, my grandma, Lillian is her name. She's in a, a home now. She has pre-diabetes. They, they call it type two, um, not full blown. So she only needs insulin whenever she's eating a big sugary meal. Like if she has a piece of chocolate cake, which she adores, right? That's like her favorite thing. Um, so the grandkids always try to slip her some cake and her kids are like, no, no, no. So she, she takes insulin when she needs it with those meals, but Predominantly, she doesn't need it unless she's eating those sugary uh, desserts, so to speak. So, like, she has a steak and potatoes dinner, and she does a little bit of walking afterwards. Typically, she doesn't need it. She only takes it when she needs it because type 2 is like a sliding scale. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, like, are they all given, like, insulin for in case because, like, my grandma has diabetes and then my cousin has diabetes and my grandma doesn't have any insulin, I don't think. And then my cousin takes it all the time. I'm pretty sure she has type one. Yeah. So that would be a good assumption. You both could have type two. And if your cousin has full blown type two where the, the he doesn't make any usable insulin, then they would need uh, to inject insulin. Yes, they're all going to have insulin on hand uh, for different reasons, obviously. But um, if you have even pre-diabetes, you will have insulin on hand. It's just hard to hard to tell. Type one always has insulin, needs it, needs it, needs it. If you have full blown type two and you cannot use any of the insulin that your pancreas creates, uh, you will need to use it all the time. But then, as you exercise more and as you eat better that type two diabetes can start to dwindle where you won't need it as much. I know that that can be a confusing thing and it, it's not a definitive. Like if you find somebody with type two diabetes, it's not, they need it after every single meal. Um, and if you find somebody with pre-diabetes, they don't need it after every single meal, especially if they're doing a little bit of walking and they're doing a little bit of exercising. Um, it's actually probably more harmful to them if they do take it um, and weaning them off of it as long as it's you know safe to do and their blood sugar doesn't get you know hyper um and that's something to, to take into consideration too i hope i answered your question that it's it's kind of a an obscure thing it's a sliding scale so to speak okay. oh i keep doing that Can you guys see the blood glucose optimal levels online? Yeah, we can. Yeah. Can you? I have it pulled up. I can see it. So you could. Yeah, I just don't think you can hear my mic very well. I can hear you for sure. Why? Wow. What's up? Are you asking another question? No, I said. That we could hear you, and then you didn't hear that, so I didn't Oh, God. If you, if you unmute yourself, say it, and unmute yourself quick. Sometimes 
doesn't pick up. So you have to unmute, wait a second, talk, mute again. That's usually kind of how that works. All right, cool. Yep. Okay, so let's talk about how the liver might affect blood glucose. Now, this is more mechanistic. This is uh, sort of on the fringe when we're talking about diabetes. Um, but you as healthy individuals, you know, that, as far as I know, we're all healthy. Uh, we, we talked about insulin being secreted from the pancreas. And while the insulin is being secreted from the pancreas, opens that GLUT4 receptor, the insulin receptor, the glucose receptor to push glucose into the cell. Now, what happens if you all are fasting, which we talked about before, for 12 hours, your glucose levels sort of remain the same. Now, if you've ever fasted for long periods of time, you could get dizzy. Uh, it could affect cognitive function just like it would in somebody with diabetes. You could have type, typo uh, uh, and not hyper, so you'd have low glucose, blood glucose. But what happens in that situation for you guys? Why do you feel better with exercise? You know, there's a large storage of glucose somewhere in the body. There's a big hint on the screen. It's in the liver. And when you exercise, when you're fasting, you, I don't want to eject is probably a bad word, but secrete glucagon, which is a stored form of glucose, um, into the bloodstream from the liver, right? That not artificially raises it, but it will keep you level. That's why you feel better after fasting state uh, with exercise, because um, now you're getting that glucose without actually even eating. Um, now you're going to burn it off, and your body actually uh, makes it, not makes it, your body wants to use more fat in this situation. If you're fasted for 12 hours, and then you go do an intense exercise, your body is going to kind of put these macronutrients into buckets, like, hey, I'm going to use fats predominantly. Um, I'm only going to use glucose sparingly because what major organ in the body only uses glucose to function? Probably an organ you can't live without. You definitely can't go to college without this organ. You're all thinking with your brain. Very good. So the brain uses primarily glucose, right? So your brain uses most of the glucose that your liver puts into the bloodstream. You do use some with muscular contractions. Um, and I will talk about ketones another day in another lecture. But whenever the liver has released the glucose stores, the body will break down fats, which are converted to another fuel source called ketones. So you use ketones as well. I'm not going to ask you any questions on that. That's beyond the scope of this class. Um, Fasting. Right. So now we know that in a healthy individual, we can increase our blood sugar just intrinsically through kind of contraction of the liver. We can decrease blood sugar with exercise. Um, individuals with diabetes can increase blood sugar, right, with eating or decrease blood sugar with insulin and exercise. There's also a third type. Okay, this is very uncommon. It, well, uncommon to what you guys are going to see. Um, I don't really know how prevalent this is, but it's called gestational diabetes. Uh, and as the term suggests, this is a pregnancy disease, disease state, um, where high blood levels of high levels of blood glucose are caused by hormonal fluctuations. Um, estrogen and progesterone increase for prolonged periods of time actually affect the ebb and flow of your glucose and your insulin. This happens, obviously, I think it's more towards the third trimester. Did I have this written down? Oh, second or third, sorry. Um, and it usually returns to normal when the baby is born. This is not always the case. And in this case, it will often turn into type one diabetes. Um, uh, so this is something to watch out for as well. I'm actually sort of going my girlfriend is pregnant and we're not, she's not, doesn't have gestational diabetes, but it's always something that's in the back of my mind just because I know it's a thing, right? So it's always something to think about, especially in that state. Okay, so some of the clinical considerations, what specifically will you be looking for in these individuals? Um, excessive thirst and frequent urination. Those are the two big flags. I talked about when my buddy was uh, sort of low blood sugar, 
He had a couple other symptoms, and that's predominantly because I know him so well that I can pick those things out. Excessive thirst and frequent urination are the top two. That will be the two red flags. Blurry vision and fatigue, some of the other ones, especially with exercise. One of the big facts I was reading an article the other day that I put in here, 25% of those with type 2 diabetes do not know, which is a scary thought. Because if you have type 2 diabetes and you need insulin, the insulin helps keep and regulate your blood sugar. As I said, with chronic uh, high blood sugar, you can get those macro and micro nicks in your arterial beds, which can really affect you down the line. Um, individuals with diabetes often have heart attacks later in life because their vessels can't dilate and constrict. Um, so they can't uh, manipulate blood flow and things of that nature. Okay, so let's look at the exercise prescription. Now, when you guys are in uh, on your tests and on your quizzes, when you have case studies, and if they come up with, uh, you know, Lillian and Gina both have diabetes, exor prescribe exercise with them, you might have to do a, a metabolic equation, and then I'm going to ask you to exercise, prescribe exercise. And it's a little bit different, like we saw with some of the other disease states. For aerobic, oh, Jesus, sorry. For aerobic, the frequency about three to seven days a week, you typically want these individuals to exercise on most days uh, because that will lessen the amount of insulin that these individuals need. 40 to 59% VO2 reserve or 11 to 13 RPE, depending on if they are on beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, their heart rate not be, might not be able to get to the point where you guys are comfortable with them exercising. And in that, and in that state, you'll use an RPE though. If they are very sedentary when they come to you, about 150 minutes a week, moving towards the goal of 300 minutes a week. And the type, emphasis on large muscle groups, walking, jogging, elliptical, things that contract the most muscles. Because as we now know, the contraction of the muscles pushes glucose into the cell, right? So that, again, means they need less insulin. The resistance, frequency, two, three days a week, that's probably predominantly what we're going to see over all of our disease states. And if you do work in a clinical, you know, rehab center, uh, especially cardiac rehab, a lot of them do not prescribe resistant, resistance exercise, but this is what ACSM recommends. Intensity, 35 to 55% 1RM, that's very low, so low intensity. And then 10 to 15, leaning towards the more repetition, so leaning towards the 15 reps. There's no time prescribed for resistance exercise and free weights and machines is what is in the book. Any questions on the exercise prescription? Some of the special considerations, no more than two days of physical act inactivity should be allowed concurrent. Um, and then there is some evidence that super high intensity exercise can help these individuals the most. So while we want them to get to 300 minutes, it has been shown in HbA1c levels that high intensity exercise might moderate blood sugar levels um, the most and most effective. And then there is some evidence that if you use both resistance and cardiovascular exercise, it is the most effective in controlling the blood glucose levels. Any questions? Okay, so if you do deal with individuals with diabetes, it is an ongoing problem. This isn't they are one way and they're going to stay one way. They have this complication, so this is what you have to treat. During the exercise bout, if you have individuals with diabetes and you have them for 30 minutes and they're doing a cardiovascular workout, you have to know that their blood sugar is going to decrease. You have to know that maybe they need a Gatorade. Maybe they need an orange juice throughout this exercise so that they can ma maintain safety. And all individuals with diabetes, especially if they had it chronically, have coping mechanisms, right? They always bring Gatorades, or maybe they'll bring an orange or something with sugar in it uh, in order so they can feel safe and feel good, right? So that's some of the things that you think about. So the quiz is now open. Not technically, I have to open it up on Blackboard, but it'll open right now, and it will remain open until tomorrow night at midnight. You have 20 minutes to do it. There's 10 questions. They're multiple choice. Read the PowerPoints that we went over last week, as well as this PowerPoint 
before you take the quiz, okay? You will not have time to look up all the questions. At least that's my hope. Anybody have any questions? Okay, we'll see you Wednesday. You have another quiz Friday afternoon, so keep that in mind too.